Part Twenty Five of Under the California Sky by Charles Francis Saunders. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part Twenty Five: Residence in the Land of Sunshine. Some Californianisms. While the settlement of our Pacific Slope by Americans is of too recent a date for any marked peculiarity of speech to have yet fastened itself upon the Californian in the sense that it has upon the New Englander or the Southerner of the Atlantic seaboard, the newcomer does not travel far in California before encountering words and expressions that are to him either absolutely strange or used in a novel sense new cots two bits a box for instance posted in a greengrocer's window is so thoroughly unintelligible to the average easterner as to read like a foreign language though to the californian it is a perfectly plain advertisement of apricots at twenty-five cents a box to be able to reckon in bits is a serviceable accomplishment for the traveller in california byways to acquire for while its use is by no means universal and the coin itself went out with the spaniards there is a certain local pride in keeping the word going and one meets it constantly it is employed only in multiples of two as two bits twenty-five cents four bits fifty cents six bits seventy-five cents high fog too is usually an enigma the tourist comes down to breakfast and finds the sky overcast cloudy day he remarks to the waiter is it going to rain oh no sir replies the man of the napkin if he is experienced only a high fog as the stranger observes no evidence of fog only a gray sky he does not see the appropriateness of the term nor why the trouble is not plain cloudiness but the californian in some strange manner knows the difference and about ten o'clock the fog so high that it seemed something else has floated out to sea and the sun shines in a cloudless blue sky then there is the word pack anybody anywhere in the united states knows how to pack a box or a trunk but we had to come to california to learn how to pack a piece of string for on this western rim of our continent half the time the word means to carry of course you have to pack your goods upon your burrow but then too the burrow packs the pack an old mountaineer of whom we had occasion once to borrow a penknife looked at it affectionately as he returned it to his pocket and remarked you bet it's a good knife i've packed it around with me for nigh on to twenty years Another interesting localism is the verb to rustle. Originating on the cattle ranges where in the old lawless bad man days it meant to steal, it has acquired in these piping times of peace the innocent significance of to gather. Thus among the camper's first duties is to rustle his firewood. He also prospects for water, and if in his search his foot slips on a slick rock, it is what is to be expected, for your thoroughgoing Californian has small use for the adjective smooth. In the camp supplies will be spuds for potatoes, and quite likely frijoles, pronounced frijoles, for beans. For saddlebags, your packer will have kayaks on the donkeys, or alforjas, alforjas, and, of course, you never travel a path, but always a trail. The principal outer influence on California speech has naturally been Spanish. Some of these Spanish terms, familiar as words to the new arrival from the East, will surprise him in their application. Corral, for instance, seems natural enough to cattle enclosures, each covering an acre or two, as he saw them from the car windows when he crossed the plains but when his california hostess who keeps her pet persian cat outdoors in a wire cage a few feet square calls that a corral it strikes him oddly canyon too which he associates with fearful rocky mountain gorges loses some of its majesty when applied to any small ravine as it may be in california the word ranch has possibilities he never dreamed of for it may describe property anywhere in extent from half an acre to three hundred thousand and while it may be a grain ranch or a cattle ranch it may also be a chicken ranch or a bee ranch or a fruit ranch but never a farm 
farmers in the golden state are ranchers but then if you have the privilege of making the acquaintance of some spanish landed proprietor do not commit the mistake of referring to his estate as a rancheria with the accent on the i for in southern california this word means an indian village in traveling through the country one encounters in everyday speech many of these spanish words more or less modified mesa for tableland is universal and chaparral for a shrubby thicket is classic though personally we have more often heard another word chamise applied to the same thing this last term pronounced chamise is also given to the common greasewood of the mountains and foothills known to botanists as adenostoma fasciculatum cienega is a good spanish survival meaning any wet marshy place and potrero is occasionally heard applied to wild pasture land rincon is where two hills come obliquely together forming a corner or nook a shallow valley is cañada pronounced cañada but this lingers now principally as a geographical designation and it is doubtful if many white californians know what it signifies arroyo is a commonly used spanish word for the channel of a stream and the bulrush of which thickets are found on the borders of marshes and certain rivers is quite commonly called tule two syllables the earthen jar that contains drinking water and stands often wrapped in dampened burlap in some shady corner in the old country houses or swings from a beam is an olla pronounced olla the swarthy mexican laborers in conical straw hats who work industriously on the railroads in southern california and on ranches are popularly known sometimes as greasers sometimes as cholos strictly speaking the word cholo is applicable only to a half-breed lower in the social scale than the true mexican perhaps of all californianisms the visitor from the atlantic seaboard finds back east the most entertaining this expression takes on a brand new significance once the sierra nevada is crossed when keeping house in pasadena one summer we employed a woman to do some cleaning for us she was talkative after the manner of her kind and had many pleasant words for the abundance and lusciousness of the fruit in california you see she explained i come from back east and we don't have much fruit there recollections of delaware peaches new jersey berries york state grapes and new england apples rose before us and we demurred what part of the east had she come from wyoming she remarked ingenuously this we have since learned is really quite far east when utah and arizona are reckoned as they are from the california standpoint in eastern territory as for texas that is way back End of part 25part twenty six of under the california sky by charles francis saunders this librivox recording is in the public domain part twenty six concerning the climate the climate in general with specific reference to southern california of all the gifts of nature to the golden state none has been more thoroughly advertised than its climate nevertheless or shall i say therefore there is nothing about which the transient visitor is apt to be more unreliably informed beforehand or to carry away with him after a few weeks visit more incomplete notion one needs to spend at least one whole year on the pacific slope before he is in position to speak of its climate in any comprehensive way and even this twelve months experience will serve only to outline its broader features of difference from the climate of our atlantic seaboard with increasing years of residence he will find need to revise many of his first conclusions and will grow more and more cautious about positive generalizations the old-time californian consequently sets many hedges about his speech when the inquiring tourist tries to pin him down to hard and fast declarations no there ain't no sunstrokes on this coast ever i hear uncle william parks remark as he drives a party of eastern school teachers in his public carriage around pasadena leastways you needn't figure on em 
to be sure last summer i did hear tell of a couple of cholos who died of the heat in a ditch up in fresno that don't often happen though course it don't rain in summer that's the dry season here you know leastways that's the way it generally is but once in so often things gets out a joint in the weather outfit up above and i have known quite a bit of rain once or twice in july no it never snows in southern california you bet except in them high mountains that is it ain't natural for it to snow in the valleys though i do mind now you speak of it that one winter a few years ago we did have a snowfall in pasadena but it melted just as fast as it touched the ground and didn't last ten minutes thunderstorms no well i do mind there was one about two years ago but there's as good as none when does the rainy season begin well now i couldn't just say november's pretty safe to figure on but then again i have seen right smart of rain in september and other years there ain't been none till pretty nigh christmas you see missus it's a bully climate all right and suits me right down to the ground and every right-minded person but when it comes to drawing up a constitution and by-laws for it to go by you'll find it jumping its bail now and then i knowed a lot more about this climate the first year i lived in it than i've ever knowed since and i've been here going on twenty-seven year this spring one of the popular misconceptions about the california climate is that it is without seasons and thousands who annually come to this coast for a month or two's outing during the winter or spring months return to their eastern homes in the belief that the whole round year is a monotony of ethereal mildness with a few disagreeable rains thrown in during four or five months of the winter and spring as a matter of fact there are four distinct seasons in california just as in the east but the extremes of the east are absent here speaking for the beautiful valleys that open to the coast and which include the particular parts of the state most resorted to by travellers while there is a marked freedom from the boisterousness which in some way mars every season in the east there is yet no lack of difference in the quality of the months as the year moves on to its consummation from december until late february for instance there is a succession of snappy mornings not infrequently with frost in the early hours and of nights briskly cold that give a special zest to the family gathering around the evening lamp and the crackling hearth fire with pussy asleep before it as the vernal equinox approaches the hillsides and mesas don their glorious raiment of wild flowers the orange blossoms load the air with fragrance and the deciduous fruit trees of the ranches the almonds the peaches the apricots the plums burgeon and flower the rains cease the songs of returning birds are heard on fence post and on treetop and spring is as decidedly spring here as anywhere on earth with the outgoing of may the hills and valley lands began to take on the summer brownness that marks the resting time of much of the plant world in this land of no rain from may till november the nights still cool but not so cool as earlier in the year are succeeded by days that during the middle hours are sufficiently warm to lure one to a siesta in the shade of a vine-covered pergola or in a patio where oleanders cast their cooling shadows and water tinkles in the fountain this is pure summer absolutely distinct from the spring that preceded it absolutely distinct also from the fall which follows it when the leaves of the deciduous trees and shrubs take on characteristic autumnal tints when the vineyards are all glorious with their purpling clusters when goldenrod is blooming and the fluffy balls of wild clematis seeds ripen in the roadside tangles and float away and when the air as the sun draws to its early setting is chill with the genuine appetizing cold of an eastern october all this seasonal change is to be appreciated only from continuance of residence and once realized the very gentleness and subtleness of it endear it to lovers of a quiet life 
there are no cold waves hot waves cyclones or blizzards no cloud bursts or thunderstorms even except in the high mountains kipling in one of his essays has whimsically alluded to the boisterous unladylike conduct of certain of the american seasons banging the door in each other's faces and in other ways misbehaving he could not have spoken so of the california seasons which are well-bred sweet-tempered and kindly yet each with a mind of its own that makes it stand out distinctly from its fellows as to wind different localities vary on the whole there is less of it that is disagreeable the desert regions excepted than on the atlantic coast though truth requires mention of a dry irritating sort called a norther or in some sections a santa anna which is to be borne with at times the norther is as discomforting to california as the mistral is to the south of france but is warm instead of cold its visitations vary in frequency in different parts of the state in many it does not occur oftener than once a year sometimes not so often as that day following day for weeks with nothing blowing stronger than a five-mile breeze then some day come certain preliminary warm puffs which gradually settle into a tempest that bends great trees like whips whistles demoniacally about the corner of the house and raises an intolerable dust the velocity gradually increases attaining on rare occasions a maximum of fifty or sixty miles an hour until every particle of moisture seems sucked out of the air and your nervous system is strained to the snapping point then suddenly it may be after twelve hours of steady blow or twenty-four there comes a lull an expiring gasp or two and to your unutterable relief a heavenly stillness pervades the universe and you thank goodness that's over oh yes says the old californian when you reproach him for it the lord sends us a norther once in a long while to keep us humble i guess but they don't come often when one does come there's nothing i know of to be done about it but to go on in the house shut the door and windows and forget it if you can then when it has blown over go out and assess the damage it won't be as much as you thought apropos of the summer it may be added that to appreciate the charm of the landscape in california all that season one needs an especially open mind we are all so disposed to reckon the pea-green beauty of the eastern summer the one proper standard by which to judge that our first disposition with respect to a prospect that is barren of much green is to call it burned up and ugly when we succeed in ridding ourselves of that convention we find that as a matter of fact the california countryside in summer is the analogue of an eastern landscape in late autumn replete with beauty less patent to the careless than that of a more flowery season but just as intense california's long rainless period of almost constant sunshine is radically different from a drought time in the east in this respect there the normal condition is fixed for frequent rains and resultant greenness and the failure of the expected moisture is a calamity because abnormal here in california the annual browning is part of the year's regular plan god's permanent ordering for the land and like all the routine of nature beautiful if one have eyes to see pastures are of course withered and hills are verdureless but the absence of bright green is made up by the abounding presence of rare tones of brown olive and yellow which pale and deepen and intermingle in countless exquisite combinations in the shifting lights of the revolving days another way of dividing the california year is into the rainy season and the dry this only means that from the middle of spring until mid-autumn there is as a rule no rain while from mid-autumn until the middle of spring again all the rain falls that does fall within the compass of the twelve months but every day is by no means a rainy day the rainfall for instance recorded at los angeles for a series of thirty years during the months of december january february and march 
averaged a total of eleven and one-half inches for these rainiest months of the rainy season, being somewhat less than three inches per month. This is not appreciably different from the average rainfall during the summer months in the east. From Santa Barbara northward, the volume of precipitation is rather greater. To the permanent dweller in California, the season of the rains is a time of especial content, for after six months of persistent dry weather, one is, if ever, properly ready to welcome a rainy day with that unreserved heartiness with which one may be sure the Lord desires his blessings received. While the winter tourist naturally enough grumbles at the rainy day as an interference with his personal plans for motoring, golfing, or taking a drive, the resident Californian is feeling aware that all the water which makes the basis of California's being the pleasant place it is to visitors must come from the clouds, if it comes at all, during this season which the tourist chooses for his own. So he smiles comfortably as he looks over his spectacles at his rain gauge and sees the column of water rising. If the visitor would but realize the fact, the winter rains in California are among the especial charms of the climate. Considering, for instance, the territory tributary to Los Angeles, nowhere are there gentler, tenderer, softer rains. Nowhere, to reverse the Shakespearean figure of speech, are rains fuller of the unstrained quality of mercy. Nowhere do they give more considerate warning of their coming, gathering openly in a sky that daily clouds up a little more and more for several days, and then beginning not in a wild whirl of wind and a burst of water spouts, but with a gentle sprinkle, which gradually increases in volume as the parched tongue of earth is moistened to take it in. Once begun, however, the rain does not readily stop. Usually for two or three days the clouds continue dripping as from a sponge that is squeezed now hard, now lightly. Occasionally there is a lifting of the mists from the mountains, revealing a snow-capped peak here and there, and letting patches of reassuring sunlight sift through to earth before the vapors shut down again and fresh showers descend and then after all is over the measurement of what has fallen during the whole course of the storm will perhaps be but an inch or two on these days of moisture you will find comfort indoors beside an open fire if you are blessed with one or lacking that by your gas grate or portable oil heater which sooner or later every wise visitant in lodgings finds it conducive to comfort to have in his room the rain should not, however, keep one indoors entirely, for while at times there is a storm that drives and dashes, more often the modest precipitation is so nearly straight downward as to make walking with an umbrella a pleasant pastime. There is a delicious coolness in the dampness which renders a light overcoat or medium-weight wrap comfortable, while the cleansing air of a rainy day in California has a caress in it that one never forgets, being free from the humid mugginess which not infrequently accompanies a winter rain on the Atlantic seaboard. Then the clearing off, the clouds breaking apart and lifting from the mountains, leaving all the peaks wreathed and the canyons smoking with rising vapor, the clean bracing dryness that succeeds the rain, the shining faces of the leaves and flowers put up to the sunshine, the stimulating winter sunshine itself, this part of the rainy program even the grumpiest tourist enjoys. Of all the surprises that California, and particularly Southern California, holds for the newcomer, probably none is more thorough than the delightfulness of the summers. When Mr. Moneybags, just out from New York or Chicago, steps from his room upon the sunny veranda of his hotel on some balmy January morning and draws his first delicious breath of the California winter, he is apt to say, throwing back the lapels of his summery coat, in which a fresh plucked flower is blooming, "'Well, there's no discount on this. It's gilt-edge paper, without doubt. But if it is this warm in winter, it must be like a furnace in summer.' 
and that is the regulation attitude of the eastern bred towards the southern california summer before he has lived through one he knows that the july temperatures of his pennsylvania or massachusetts home range anywhere from forty to eighty degrees higher than in midwinter and when he comes to california and sees the thermometer at noon on new year's day standing at seventy five in the shade it seems natural enough to reckon on a summer temperature of a hundred and fifteen to a hundred and fifty five now as a matter of fact the entire coastal region of southern california as far inland as the influence of the pacific trade winds and ocean fogs is felt the region in which for instance such well-known tourist cities as santa barbara pasadena los angeles and san diego lie has a particularly charming summer climate there is an occasional brief spell rarely of more than three or four days duration of undeniably hot weather to be expected during the progress of every summer but the nights and mornings are even then deliciously cool and the days so devoid of any perceptible humid quality and so tempered by the regular wind off the sea that the midday temperature during such times though it ascends sometimes into the nineties and occasionally even to a hundred is never prostrating yet even after the easterner has decided to settle in the state and has been told and told and told again that the summers in california the desert counties excepted are no warmer than anywhere else while anywhere within fifty miles of the coast they are really cooler than the atlantic seaboard ever dreamed of for summer weather he still finds it hard to accept the totally different conditions of the pacific slope at their face value our cousin jane from philadelphia is typical of this frame of mind and her first summer in pasadena was a typical experience she arrived in the early part of april being exceedingly fond of flowers she was every day filled with joy at the wonderful sight of the gardens and of the countryside in its vernal freshness like most people having a good time in california she lost track of the calendar entirely and enjoyed herself unreservedly one morning at breakfast she suddenly inquired the day of the month mercy me she exclaimed when told it was the last day of june you don't mean to say that next week will be the fourth of july after breakfast we saw her examining the thermometer that hung in a shady corner of the porch why she said looking disturbed she hates hot weather and removing a light shawl which she had found comfortable in the cool breakfast room do you know it is seventy-six and not half-past eight yet it's going to be a scorching hot day it was in vain that we told her that the mercury had been just as high at the same hour for the last couple of weeks and that the absence of humidity took the unbearableness out of high temperatures seventy-six was seventy-six to cousin jane and meant at least eighty-six by lunch-time and that of course was too hot for any mortal use so like don quixote fighting the windmill cousin jane set her lance in rest against the weather in orthodox philadelphia style taking it for granted that the sunlit outdoors was as hot as it looked which it never is in california she decided to stay indoors and abjured her daily walk abroad she pulled down the shades to keep out the glare and shut down the windows of her room to keep out the heat she fanned herself in season and out and at noon lay on the lounge with closed eyes immediately after lunch she retired to the gloom of her darkened chamber and lay down to thoughts of the stifling heat we recognized all the motions of a hot summer day in the east as tea-time drew near she came forth from retirement clad in her coolest gauziest attire and took another look at the thermometer it was still well up in the seventies so she carried a chair out upon the shadiest part of the lawn and sat down under a tree the same cool trade wind that had been gently blowing all day and had made work in the broad sunshine even at midday entirely bearable to the rest of the family though cousin jane's mind had been unable to accept such a doctrine was still blowing and played maliciously across her shoulders 
had the thermometer been ten degrees lower she would have said the air was cool but with the mercury not far from eighty how could it be cool it certainly would have been hot at that in philadelphia and why should it be different here so cousin jane stuck it out gamely until the tea-bell rang she went to bed early that night and next morning came to breakfast with her shawl on i seem to have caught cold she said peevishly this is a queer climate it would appear that cousin jane's lance had gotten entangled in the remorseless sweep of the windmill sail and she had been thrown end of part twenty six Part twenty seven of Under the California Sky by Charles Francis Saunders. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part twenty seven concerning the climate, the invalid, and the climate. In the case of invalids, it is to be borne in mind that the climate in itself does not cure, but it enables the ailing one who is careful to take the needful steps in the line of his cure without the aggravating assaults upon his progress to which the eastern climate do what he will subjects him in such an eastern city as philadelphia for instance or boston no man with a weak throat or a disposition to catarrhal troubles can possibly get through a winter without a certain number of colds in southern california there is no need of his having a single one if he be careful to wear woolen underclothing to avoid sitting in the shade and always to carry an overcoat if he is to be out after sundown thus if he has any doctoring to do or any special course of treatment to follow he can benefit steadily by it without encountering the setbacks of recurring colds which in the climate of the east with its sudden and violent changes are practically inescapable footnote a word should be added about humidity on the pacific slope as the reports of the united states weather bureau are misleading on this subject they state for los angeles for example a mean humidity of about seventy one degrees for the year the same as at philadelphia which among its natural advantages makes no claim to a climate of low humidity in point of fact the term humidity in ordinary parlance stands for a certain enervating oppressive mugginess rarely ever felt in california and for this the weather bureau has no descriptive word its humidity is simply the degree of moisture in the air two other facts need to be borne in mind in relation to the weather bureau reports one the office observations are taken at eight a m and eight p m and while data compiled on this basis probably represents the average conditions for the twenty-four hours on the atlantic seaboard they do not so represent those of the pacific since they fail to take account of the prevailing low humidity of the pacific coast midday owing to the nearness of the ocean on one side and the desert on the other slight wind shifts cause marked and rapid fluctuations in the moisture content of the air which are ignored in computing the daily averages for instance during spring and summer at los angeles the degree of atmospheric moisture is high in the early morning perhaps ninety degrees and decreases rapidly as soon as the usual morning cloudiness high fog breaks away this decrease continues until afternoon when the moisture-laden wind sets in from the pacific bringing the evening coolness the average midday humidity at los angeles is about fifty degrees and at points farther inland considerably lower two on the atlantic seaboard the excessive humidities accompany high temperatures while in california the direct opposite is the rule when the humidity is high on the pacific slope it is because of a cooling ocean breeze which is naturally invigorating and exhilarating the author is indebted for much of the above statement of facts to a b wallaber in charge of the local weather office at los angeles End note. to this passive advantage the california climate offers the positive benefit of an abundance of sunshine a lower relative humidity than the atlantic seaboard and a pronounced equability 
of these three the greatest of value to the average invalid is the sunshine an invigorating energy which for many ills is doctor and nurse rolled into one even in summer it is to most californians not enervating but distinctly stimulating and sunstroke is a word practically without place in the california vocabulary the special climatic feature of danger is the great difference in temperature between day and night and between sunshine and shadow people from the east rarely realize this when they first arrive and are disappointed that they cannot be comfortable in midwinter in alpaca coats and gauze undershirts we always recommend our friends to bring all their winter outfit except ulsters and they find that at one time or another it is all needed the people who complain of the pacific coast climate and there are many such will in all probability be found to have neglected common sense requirements as to clothing customarily in a pasadena winter for instance the thermometer stands at from forty to fifty at breakfast time rises to seventy or even eighty at midday and dropping rapidly as the sun nears its setting is back again in the forties by bedtime the human system was never framed to meet changes of some thirty degrees fahrenheit in six or eight hours without some corresponding change in dress yet one finds some men shivering along on winter nights in summer clothes and no overcoat and women in gauzy shirtwaists and no hats and if they do not develop rheumatism or chronic catarrh it is only because they do not stay in california long enough if one is seeking climate in california there is a considerable choice in the selection of a place of sojourn climates vary markedly within a short distance the air of pasadena for instance charming as it is to most is not beneficial to all as the prevalence of the ocean night fogs which temper the summer climate and contribute largely to the city's delightfulness as a summer residence imparts a degree of dampness to the atmosphere which is not best for certain conditions of health riverside or redlands with their drier air might prove better for these but the drier heat of their summers due to the distance from the sea make summer residents so far inland rather oppressive banning in the san gorgonio pass overlooking the desert has its advocates for diseases of the respiratory system and the foothill towns perched on the rim of the san gabriel valley places like sierra madre and monrovia connected with los angeles by direct electric lines have the advantage salutary to many conditions of being well above the ordinary fogs of spring and summer and yet within the cooling influence of the sea central california too is rich in phases of climate that make it a section to be reckoned with by the health seeker the napa valley just north of san francisco is one of many that have an enviable reputation in this regard this valley as the readers of robert louis stevenson's works will remember is the scene of his silverado squatters it is indeed misleading ever to speak of california's climate rather should we speak plurally of its climates of which there are almost as many varieties as post offices and a matter of a few miles will often make an essential difference to the invalid cases have been known to be at a standstill in altadena for instance that have improved steadily at pasadena five miles away and vice versa it is therefore of the greatest importance to health seekers not to make up their minds prior to coming to california as to the particular locality where they will settle individual cases often involve different requirements and in view of the wide choice to select from it is wise to look about and experimentally test a number of places before deciding on any end of part twenty seven part twenty eight of under the california sky by charles francis saunders this librivox recording is in the public domain part twenty eight camp cookery for the non-professional camper what ours is not with apologies to mr stuart edward white 
it was before the days of some experiences set down in this book and sylvia was seated at a civilized window in a civilized room reading a large green volume she looked troubled passing through the room i noted the anxious expression and inquired the cause the book was closed with some emphasis i am discouraged she said i was alarmed when before had sylvia been discouraged she who had always found the interests of life rise with the increasing difficulty of its daily problems and who thanked heaven for obstacles because they made such admirable stepping stones to greater heights what catastrophe had dampened this cheerful spirit what barrier had closed the door of hope this man and sylvia made a vicious poke at the green volume this man is telling how to cook in the wilderness i have never cooked in the wilderness in my life but the performance as he describes it does not seem difficult the difficulty to my mind lies in his results they would simply kill us both now we are planning trips as wild as these do we have to live in this dreadful way please listen to this and she read a stomach-turning recipe involving the compounding of flour raisins baking powder fat salt pork and sugar mixed into this mess with a quantity of larrapy dope having written a little myself i felt privileged to speak as one of the craft and so i expounded my views of the matter the author is just astonishing the natives a little i think nobody has to live that way anywhere and certainly we don't the men in this book were possessed of iron nerves and robust physiques and the very bohemianism of their fare was part of the fun to them we are of a different make-up we have nerves and stomachs and livers that must be treated with a certain consideration or we are out of the running now i think we can prove to ourselves and to the public whom we shall try to reach with the account of the accomplishment that it is entirely possible to live in the wilderness like people of gentle breeding and to provide a hundred miles from anywhere without any extraordinary outlay of means a menu and a menage to which we should feel in no wise ashamed to invite our most particular friends only we won't the following chapters are an endeavor to show how this was done and contains some practical directions based on our own experience as to how others may achieve a similar result end of part twenty eight part twenty nine of under the california sky by charles francis saunders this librivox recording is in the public domain part twenty nine camp cookery for the non-professional camper the comforts of home when camping to invade the time-honored realm of the camp frying pan and smoke blackened coffee pot with any new suggestions for camp cookery is a fearsome venture flapjacks and bacon dished up on a tin plate and wrenched down to use a favorite expression of a guide we once employed with coffee always coffee and yet again coffee served in a granite ware cup with a tin spoon these are inseparably linked in many minds with the idea of camp life which accordingly has been thought not for those less vigorous who even in an outdoor existence cannot digest fried fare or drink unlimited coffee we know nevertheless from experience that two people of the latter type can travel through the wilds of arizona new mexico or california with entire ease provided there be a little forethought and some understanding of cookery but some time must be spent beforehand in careful packing and considerable extra costs of transportation must be reckoned on also it is well to be able to avail oneself of the natural products of the location where one may be camped and here a little pioneer lore and botanical knowledge will come into play for example lemons cannot be had everywhere but one of the commonest shrubs of the california mountains is a species of sumac known as the indian lemonade bush from the sticky red berries of which by simply steeping them in cold water for a few minutes a refreshing acid drink may be made 
neither may one hope for watermelon in the desert but the fruit of the prickly pear and some other cacti is almost as delicious as the watermelon with somewhat of its flavor such luxuries too as lettuce and spinach are not to be expected in the wilderness but a frequent weed in certain sections of the state is a relative of the spring beauty of the east known as miners or indian lettuce the younger stems and leaves of which boiled with bacon and served with slices of hard-boiled egg if you have eggs with you make a capital substitute for other greens in laying in supplies for a camping trip it is well to take as few canned things as possible as these are heavy to transport and if needed can usually be bought from the traders or supply stations on the road so also can bacon coffee and tea usually all of quite good quality if space is very limited the trader can be depended upon also for flour but as this is frequently poor at some places it is preferable to carry one's own we take less flour than do most providers and more cornmeal if one understands the possibilities of the latter there is a varied number of appetizing dishes to be made from it they are more nutritious than wheat breads besides affording more variety white cornmeal is much more delicate and less apt to grow strong in hot weather than the yellow meal which nearly every veteran camper will tell you to buy after you have listened respectfully to his advice, take white cornmeal. Always use the best baking powder. Traders, as a rule, have only inferior grades. Better still, do not use any, but substitute cream of tartar and soda in the proportions respectively of two to one, or yeast when procurable. Take several different kinds of dried beans instead of all one kind if you ever crave variety it will be in the matter of beans the white navy bean the pink frijole and the dried lima make a grateful assortment of nutrition in a small compass carry as much dried fruit as possible and again study variety prunes once or twice are bearable but prunes always are a weariness to the flesh so besides these it is well to pack small quantities each of dried peaches apples apricots figs and dates and then fill in every crack of the baggage with english walnuts and raisins then there are also evaporated apples which the traders usually carry and which make a welcome change from the common dried apple of commerce we give very little space to condensed milk never having found its gummy sweetness a satisfactory addition to our menus for those whose contentment in camp is dependent on something of the sort some brand of evaporated cream is in our judgment to be preferred to condensed milk as eggs are at the bottom of so many culinary triumphs we take as many as it is possible to carry get them absolutely fresh wipe them carefully and pack the requirements of your first week in oatmeal or any dried cereal which you may be taking they will in this way stand a great deal of rough travel the supply for the latter part of your trip should first be greased then dipped in salt each wrapped carefully in paper and packed in boxes if they can be packed in salt so much the better they make in this way heavy packages but it is the best manner we have found to tide them in cookable condition over several weeks of travel or camping with respect to butter secure a perfectly fresh lot and pack it in small jelly glasses with tight lids allowing one glass full for two persons for one day be careful not to work or smear the butter around in the packing or it will lose its sweetness and never be good afterwards keep it as cool as possible during transportation above all protected from the sun and at once upon reaching camp bury it in a box in the shade preferably near water for drinkables a bottle of raspberry vinegar and one of unfermented grape juice will not be difficult to carry and will prove wonderful stimulants to cheerfulness under some adverse conditions which will come to the best regulated camp for a steady hot drink we have found invaluable a certain preparation of cocoa called chocolactine which has not the liver-clogging or headache-producing quality of ordinary cocoa 
moreover unlike so many preparations of concentrated nutriment it is entirely palatable it is a coarse powder containing besides the cocoa an admixture of milk and sugar four teaspoonsful dropped into a cup of hot water are instantaneously converted into a delicious wholesome brew there are times however when to certain temperaments nothing takes the place of a cup of hot tea as this is readily made it is well to carry a packet of the leaves along even on trips of a few hours the question of meat in mountain fastnesses or desert is always a perplexing one dried beef in the chunk is good this being the most concentrated form available and in this shape it keeps better than when shipped and the amount for each meal is sliced off as needed bacon of course is one of the main standbys and variety may be secured by taking with you a piece of pickled pork not dried salt pork which is a very different thing and will not keep well and keeping it packed in salt in as cool a place as your camp affords when there is a sportsman in your party even if you are not out primarily for game your larder may be enlivened by the addition of a rabbit now and then and in a trout country there is of course fish in season for frying purposes the fat from fried bacon is by far the best material both for digestion's sake and also to many palates for tastiness if you use many fried things provide yourself before starting with some bacon rinds from the meat shop and render the fat down to take with you packed in a tight jar if you do not fry much the fat left over from the bacon cooked in camp will be enough for ordinary purposes end of part twenty nine Part thirty of Under the California Sky by Charles Francis Saunders. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part thirty Camp Cookery for the Non Professional Camper Some Recipes to Fit the Wilds. If for a brief time you are situated where none but canned meats can be obtained, a situation which from the standpoint of gastronomic comfort is to be avoided as far as possible, you will find that the following dish, known to us as the cowboy's delight, will prove an acceptable interlude in the monotony. Into a pint of boiling water slice two small onions and several potatoes, season well with salt and pepper, and when the potatoes are nearly done, add one can of corned beef cut into dice. If you have butter and flour, rub together a teaspoonful of each and thicken with it. This amount will barely suffice for two normal appetites on a cold day, and if a reasonably hungry cowboy drops in, the quantity will need to be at least doubled. If corned beef is scarce, use more potatoes and onions. A dish which in our camp experience we have found particularly palatable to all partakers goes by the name of the Arizona Special. It is compounded as follows. Put into a saucepan one and one-half cups of cornmeal. Pour boiling water upon this till it is of the consistency of chicken feed. Add a lump of butter, varying from the size of a walnut to that of an egg, according to your supply of butter. Cover this closely, that the meal may steam and the butter melt. Beat up two eggs and add them, with one teaspoon of salt and two of sugar, to the cornmeal after the butter is melted beat this together and add sufficient cold water to make a rather thick batter that will drop not pour from the spoon add to this two rounding teaspoonsfuls of baking powder beat thoroughly and turn into your frying pan which must be hot on the campfire or stove and greased with plenty of bacon fat cover closely with a tight lid and cook over a very slow fire by being closely covered, this mixture will be practically baked. It should be turned out upon the lid when done, and slid back again into the frying pan with the brown side up, so as to brown the side that was on top. If this is properly made, your only difficulty will be in supplying enough of it. But, someone objects, where are eggs to be had in the wilderness? Of course, if you have no eggs, do not use them 
but as explained elsewhere in this book one who believes in comfort in camping can arrange to have them under any ordinary conditions they are no more trouble to transport than anything else when you get used to it naturally however there are times when the best laid plans for an egg supply gang a glay in which emergency a pleasant dish is the following which even at home is one of the best ways of using cornmeal make a plain cornmeal mush boiling it if you have the time for several hours allow it to cool only slightly meantime stirring it well it should be well salted and quite thick in consistency now into a frying pan with an abundance of hot bacon fat drop this hot cornmeal by spoonfuls making so many fat little cakes each separate from the other when one side of a cake has browned this will take some time turn the other side to brown also serve hot off the griddle simple as the process sounds it must be carefully done to get the right results but when successful the taste of this is entirely different from that of the usual fried cold cornmeal mush and is sure to make a sensation with those who have not eaten it before to one of our desert camps three young men employed upon a government errand connected with the geodetic survey came along with their pack train one morning and we invited them to stay to dinner we happened to be flush of cornmeal that day and our guests were accordingly served with this particular make of mush from the rapidity with which it disappeared from the plates we soon saw it had made a hit presently in the midst of an animated conversation one of the party in the act of putting a piece of mush in his mouth paused and suddenly said to sylvia madam i beg your pardon but is this delectable thing mush just what i've been wanting to ask ever since we began eating said number two it's sure out of sight mush you clodhopper interjected number three it can't be it's ambrosia mush was never like that when the true inwardness of the article was explained to them and the consumption of it was resumed number one nodded his head to the others solemnly he remarked as one who had seen a great light on his future course get on to that boys she fries it while it's hot there are times when a frying pan with a tight lid is not to be scorned as an oven besides the arizona special already described we have frequently in emergencies had to make baking powder bread in a frying pan two cups of flour a heaping teaspoonful of shortening a teaspoonful of baking powder salt to taste and cold water to make a stiff dough are all that is needed a piece of brown paper spread on a stone answers for a table in an impromptu camp and a bottle makes a good rolling pin flour the paper and the rolling pin bottle if the dough sticks roll it out into a cake half an inch in thickness and bake it in the frying pan with a lid tightly on over a very slow fire of course when the bottom side browns when nearly done the bread can be turned over and browned on the other side be sure not to have too hot a fire or the bread will scorch on the outside and be raw in the middle since it is more digestible we prefer this sort of bread to the usual camper's biscuit which is baked in the frying pan and tilted up before the fire to brown the tops there is also no reason when camping for any protracted stay why one should not have a yeast risen bread in a california camp this idea may be ridiculed by those accustomed to rougher camp life but we have never observed that there is any flagging on the part of these spartans in consuming their full share of any homemade bread set before them in the wilds presupposing that one understands bread making at home one simply sets the sponge at night putting it in the camp oven after the fire is extinguished and while the oven still retains a slight heat in the morning make up the bread in the dough set it well covered in the sun to rise and bake in the oven of the camp stove if a stove is not in camp yeast bread may be baked in a dutch oven but for success in this one must thoroughly understand the management of this historic cooking pot the yeast to be employed in all this is that for sale everywhere in the west in the form of dried cakes be sure that it is not stale 
of the few tinned goods which we have carried on our outings we have always found canned tomatoes the most useful despite the prejudice which exists against them in some minds on the score of health being so extensively used throughout the west they are we believe generally put up with care and we have never experienced any deleterious results from them the men on the cattle ranges find the liquidity of a fresh open can of tomatoes a decided improvement on the alkaline water of many arid sections and to them it serves as meat and drink of the many ways in which the juice and the tomato itself may be employed in cookery perhaps the least known is the fried canned tomato with a little butter hot in a frying pan the larger and firmer pieces of the canned tomato will generally be found solid enough to fry very satisfactorily season well cover them closely in the pan and be careful that they do not scorch next in value to the tomato canned corn is recommended this besides being useful heated and served as it comes from the can may if you have an egg or two be developed into quite a presentable corn pudding or if beaten up with an equal quantity of corn meal into a thin batter with an egg a little butter and baking powder and the whole baked in the form of cakes in the frying pan a result is attained which in the wilderness has more than once been feelingly voted an all right corn fritter you bet one finds some excellent brands of canned string beans in western stores but in view of your necessary stock of dried beans the canned articles need not enter into your calculations unless you have a surplus of room in that event a can of these string beans will make a very pleasant interlude of greenery in a long drawn-out diet of dried foods in the matter of cooking fish in the wilderness there is some choice one of the best ways is the time-honored one of wrapping the fish well washed salted and peppered in damp tissue paper if you have it or failing that in ordinary brown manila paper dampened and laying it thus enveloped in the hot ashes of the campfire some experience will be needed to teach the novice the proper hotness of the ashes and the length of time to leave the fish in but the knowledge gained will be worth the sacrifice of a few trout it is to be noted that the ashes while they need be quite hot must not contain red-hot coals to come in contact with the fish the degree of heat striven for in your ashes should be in a general way that of a hot oven for which the ash bed acts as a substitute to secure in the fish an entirely different but just as delicious a flavor find a thin smooth slab of stone a foot or so square and support this at the four corners on four small stones to serve as short legs build under the slab a hot fire and keep it going until the stone is thoroughly heated then grease this improvised griddle with bacon fat and lay your fish well seasoned upon it if the fish are small it will not be necessary to turn them as the steady heat of the stones will cook them evenly through in making this sort of a griddle do not be disturbed if a stone or two flies explosively into several pieces some stones do that in such an event try another kind salmon a la san francisco is excellent for using up a can of salmon already opened it received its name from being a popular dish in the dark days immediately succeeding the great san francisco fire when everybody was cooking in the streets and open lots this is it boil potatoes so as to have rather more potato than salmon mix potato and salmon and season highly with salt and pepper and scraped onion chopping in also if you have it a boiled egg add a little warm water to keep from being too dry and bake in a frying pan tightly covered over a very slow fire as directed for the arizona special apropos of rabbits on which the camper out in california reckons more or less largely for variety in his bill of fare it is said that the flesh of the jack-rabbit at some seasons of the year is not good for food but in our own experience we have never encountered specimens which were not perfectly satisfactory if parboiled for a few minutes the water then thrown out and the meat started again in a fresh supply of hot salted water 
The jackrabbit, which at its best is a delicious game meat, is always preferably to be boiled or baked, but of course when it comes to them little bresh rabbits, as one of our chance acquaintances in the San Gabriel foothills lovingly called the molly cottontails, these may be fried as simply and easily as spring chickens. End of Part 30Part 31 of Under the California Sky by Charles Francis Saunders. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 31 Camp Cookery for the Non Professional Camper The Dutch Oven. As Sancho Panza blessed the man who invented sleep, so do we bless the genius who first thought of the Dutch oven. When you are in a permanent camp where a stove is denied you, the Dutch oven puts an unscrub-offable, triple-plated silver lining to the cloud. It is simply a homely iron pot, utterly styleless, standing on three short legs and covered with a close-fitting iron lid that has a raised rim all around its edge. Ours is ten inches in diameter, weighs fifteen pounds, and is steeped in such memories of stewed jackrabbit, baked beans of royal flavor, corn pone, and white wheaten loaves, that one look at it on the bluest of blue Mondays routs the devil, foot, horse, and dragoons. When ready for cooking, set the oven on a bed of live coals, and sprinkle a layer of similar coals upon the lid the upturned rim will hold them in place, thereby ensuring an even heat all about the contents and a hot cover which will put an entrancing brown on bread or other edibles inside. To become a cordon bleu after the order of the Dutch oven requires long personal experience and the art cannot be communicated through printer's ink. There are three essential features, however, which when observed will start any one well on the way. First, be sure to choose one, the lid of which has an upturned rim. Some are lacking in this. Secondly, do not have too much fire either beneath the oven or on the lid. Third, be sure that the lid is on tight, for therein lies the Dutch oven's peculiar virtue, and a leak there is fatal. Looseness of the lid may be due to either of two conditions, your own carelessness in setting the lid on the pot, or a flaw in the manufacture. To guard against the latter contingency, it is prudent to try the lid at the time of purchase, and take none that does not fit snugly. One of the most serious moments of our outdoor life resulted from failure to do this. We had come into possession of a chicken at a particular time when surfeited with bacon and canned salmon we craved fresh meat, and that special chicken, unlike John's of famous memory, was really a fine one. It was a fowl of distinguished appearance, a Plymouth Rock, we thought, a hen with a comfortable tendency to embonpoint unusual in the general run of chickens known to campers, and our mouths watered as we picked and dressed it. Our old Dutch oven, the companion of many trips, had become damaged on a previous outing, and the one we had brought with us on this occasion was new, and we had not yet happened to have used it. It was got out and scrubbed, and the chicken, dismembered and divided into neat links and morsels, was laid in and proved a perfect fit. Then, when water and seasoning and all the accompaniments had been added, the pot with its cover on was set upon the bed of glowing coals and a shovel full of embers placed on the lid. It was a famous sight for hungry eyes. It was a frosty Sunday morning of October in the San Gabriel Mountains when this took place, and the old Californian was with us. To distract our impatient thoughts while the chicken cooked, we all went for a walk for it is one of the strong points of the Dutch oven that it does not have to be watched. You set it on the coals, and it does the rest. Filled with high thoughts inspired by the autumnal glories of the mountain weather, and hungrier than ever, we returned after two hours to find the camp enveloped in a suspicious odor. "'Something is burning,' cried Sylvia in dismay. The old Californian made a dash for the Dutch oven and lifted the lid." "'Worse than that,' he groaned. "'Something has burned,' and he tipped up the luckless pot for us to see. 
the interior was black with the charred remains of what was once our cherished chicken burned to a finish not a shred of flesh not a bit of gristle not a bone was left in recognizable form given these pathetic cinders cuvier might have guessed them to be gallus domesticus but never in the world could he have proved it human speech is notoriously inadequate to certain crises of life and this was one it was the lid i can remember the old man murmuring as he mechanically picked up the can opener and reached for a can of sardines it doesn't fit he maundered on see it wobbles jolting the pot and causing the lid to seesaw and click the next dutch oven we bought we tested for air tightness before it left the store end of part thirty one part thirty two of under the california sky by charles francis saunders this librivox recording is in the public domain part thirty two postscript the preceding pages profess to give nothing more than a hint of the joy and interest that attend travel by unbeaten ways in california or leisurely residence in the tourist belt the state is still so young among american commonwealths and her wide territories are still so little settled that the lineaments of that virgin landscape which so delighted the early pioneers are yet far from obliterated one may still camp on fremont's trail in surroundings practically unchanged from those which the great pathfinder himself described sixty-odd years ago may stumble over perhaps the self-same stones that pio pico's horses kick on the spanish high roads that lead across the passes down to the desert and old mexico may tread in the very footsteps of the mission fathers from san diego to san francisco bay may look out from some peak of the sierra's crest upon forests as yet unscarred by the lumberman and upon sagebrush plains where the red indian still dwells and sets up his thatched wickiup it is this nearness to the fresh morning of romance that gives a special zest to life under the sky in california while one's physical frame is ever grateful for the ease with which one may come from such ventures into the wild back to the comforts of a civilized life there to talk it all over with one's friends to rest and repair and to go again end of part thirty two end of under the sky in california by charles francis saunders